Yes, currently I have a band, I have another band called Ideal Bread. It's a Steve Lacey repertory band. Um, our last record came out in 2010. Now that I'm getting this holus bolus stuff out of the way, I'm, uh, my, for my previous band, I'm starting work on the next record, which we're rehearsing. I'm gonna start doing some shows in the fall and we'll see, and uh, I'd like to record early next year. We'll see, see what we can get out and how soon and things like that. But yeah, that band's going on now. It's, I mean, I wish I could say it was for like deep spiritual impulses or reasons, but it, I, it's totally shallow reasons. I met him and he just was one of the weirdest, most interesting, sweetest, smartest guys I've ever met. And he's just a lot of fun to be around. And um, his, his music just struck me as, um, and sometimes still does, is very impenetrable. And I just, uh, I'm kind of watching him in person and trying to play his music with him, but then listening to his records and going to hear his band, and I just kind of sussed out that his, he had a very distinctive methodology, which is very time consuming, but very simple and elegant, which is kind of his approach, which I was really drawn to, which is that, um, and it's really best exemplified by uh, what he did with the, when he had the Thelonious Monk group back in the late 50s and early 60s, which he had for about four years, I think three and a half, four years, and he had this band, and all they ever played was Thelonious Monk's tunes. They would play in Greek restaurants and cafes and anywhere, and that's all they played. And Monk was still very much alive. Um, Monk's music, I think, to him was attractive but impenetrable, but rather than sitting down and talking about it, he just sat down and learned the tunes and played them, and just played them again and again and again and again. Um, and that just struck me as an eminently sane and practical way of approaching of trying to answer a question, of trying to deal with something mysterious. So, to me, it's just, it's, I don't know if I call it part of a lineage, but I definitely feel like I've, I watched how Steve dealt with Thelonious Monk's music, and then just thought I would do the same exact thing with his music. That rather than read inter just read interviews or talk about it or listen to records only, that I would work with the actual stuff of it, and transcribe it, and get other people nearly as obsessive as me to get together and just keep trying to play the tunes over and over again. So in a certain sense, I've never felt like that that band was actually all that radical. Um, I can understand why other people do. There's no soprano saxophone in it. But to me, it was like, I just felt like we we're exactly duplicating what I at least perceive him to be doing, what I see him doing. And, and then off of, until now, until the new stuff that we're doing now, like our arrangements have always been very simple just recreations of the exact way he did them, pretty much, with only a couple of exceptions. This next batch of tunes and records is going to be very different, but um, I feel like we've been apprentices for about, the band's been together five years, six years, so it's been a long time. Tell people who, 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 uh, who was in the group with you for the audio brand. Uh, currently, the band is uh, myself on baritone saxophone and then Kirk Kanufke on cornet and uh, Toma Fujiwara on drums and Richard Giddens on bass that is the current lineup. Um, Kirk and I just did a duo of some of Steve's music a couple nights ago in Brooklyn. We're playing again in Brooklyn in September and I'm gonna see what I can, what kind of work I can drum up for us. And we started rehearsing, you know, semi, twice a month, do twice a month rehearsals, so. <laughs> Josh Sinton. To see more videos, go to jazztimes.com. <laughs>